Doctors could be on the brink of a breakthrough. Migraines. How to control them. Tame a migraine. A severe migraine. Throbbing, recurring headaches. Given all the noise, navigating the migraine experience can be confusing and scary, but you do not have to do it alone. Welcome to the Migraine Guy podcast, the official podcast of themigraineguy.com and theheadachereview.com. Now, here's your host. What is up, everyone? It's Kevin here, the Migraine Guy, bringing you another edition of the Migraine Guy podcast. Sorry again for the somewhat inconsistent schedule that's going to occur this semester, but after this semester, the uh, podcast will be back to definitely being weekly, so look forward to that. But until then, thanks for sticking with me. If you're new to the podcast, what I like to do here in the first quarter of the show is just give a little bit of an update to my migraines uh, and any medications I'm taking, etc. over the last week or so since the last podcast. Then we hop into some migraine news then we get to a migraine tip of the week and then we close the show with some closing thoughts so if you like that kind of content make sure to hit subscribe if you're listening on itunes a a review on itunes uh, preferably a five-star review with some comments would be awesome that helps other people find this podcast there are a growing number of migraine podcasts out there and i just want to maintain um, our status as uh, one of the first. So um, let's go ahead and get those reviews in if you wouldn't mind. So let's see here what has been going on the last week or so with my migraines. Well, the uh, trochandy that I was on, um, I'm not exact. I'm not. I'm not on it anymore. I'm not exactly sure if there was a buildup um, of it in my system over the last six to eight weeks. But the last two weeks of using it, I felt just like I couldn't think straight. I felt like I was in a fog. I was constantly tired. Um, and it hadn't been that way for like the first, you know, six or maybe five or six weeks of taking it, which was really encouraging to me. I thought, well, even if it's not going to work, at least I'm not experiencing side effects. Uh, I may have even said that on the podcast a couple of times when I was talking about how the trochandy was affecting me. Um, but yeah, the last two, two and a half weeks have just been uh, fairly difficult with the trochandy. And I uh, emailed the neurologist and I said, is this kind of normal where trochandy just takes longer to build up? And these side effects show up later, given that it's low dosage and time release. And he said, well, it's not uncommon. Uh, I don't think he really knew the answer to it, but he said it's not uncommon. And that if I wanted to go off the trochandy, I could. Um, And if I wanted to stay on it for a while, I could do that also. Now, the downside to um, the kind of side effects that I was uh, experiencing, specifically inability to sleep, um, consistently was making my migraines uh, much more frequent and much, much worse. Um, and so I, uh, just decided, you know, this is my, basically my last semester, um, until, or sorry, this is my last semester needing to be on campus for my graduate program. And so, um, I kind of am in survival mode this semester. And so I went ahead and went off the trochendi, um, and, Let's see, that would have been last week. And this last week of not being on Trokendi has been, um, uh, I don't want to say pleasant because I've still been getting migraines, but the migraine pain has uh, receded quite a bit. Um, they're still frequent, but they're not in that five to seven pain range. They're back down to that three to five pain range. And um, I've reintroduced uh, melatonin before I go to sleep, and that has helped me get some decent sleep um, fairly consistently. And uh, So I've noticed the migraine pain going back to its normal levels. Now, someone reached out to me, uh, Sarah Cairo, one of our uh, moderators over in the Facebook support group that we have, the Migraine Guy support group, the best migraine support group out there. Um, And she asked me, uh, because she was considering using it, if I thought that maybe there was a correlation between the upticks in my migraine pain uh, going from that three to five pain range up to five to seven more commonly, um, and the... um, introduction of trochandy into my system and then the elimination of trochandy uh, from my system um, when I started and stopped taking it. And so that was something I actually hadn't considered. And um, the uh, results do seem to show that it was at least correlated. Um, The uh, intensity of my migraines did get more uh, more pronounced as I was on trochandy week after week. I noticed my migraines were kind of getting up there in the pain range more frequently. And then since coming off of trochandy, I've noticed that they've gone back down, as I said, to their normal levels. So, you know, a lot of these migraine meds, given how they affect brain chemistry, uh, do sometimes, maybe fairly often, uh, have as side effects headaches. And, um, 
Uh, and so that can just be part of the uh, irony of some of the medications that we try. Um, so there, there is a chance, I don't know definitively, of course, but there is certainly a, a good chance that they were contributing in one way or another to more headaches, more uh, migraines. And um, <clears throat> so that's just, that's just where it is. So I'm not on Trocandy anymore. Um, uh, I'll be doing a, few, a full review of it, what it is, what Topamax is in general and stuff on the YouTube channel. Uh, this week has gotten insanely busy and I need to pump out a bunch of videos for uh, the No Time for Migraines campaign that I am a part of. So probably can't get to it this week. Plus I need to do a video, a, a requested video by someone. Uh, they want me to talk about migraines and epilepsy. Uh, because they experience them and they want some uh, advocacy for this condition, which is extremely debilitating, known as migralepsy. So I'll be getting to that um, this week. Also, probably be getting uh, the No Time for Migraine videos recorded today, and then I can put in some research and some time to Saturday or Sunday to get the migralepsy video uh, up and going. And then in the next few weeks, hopefully I'll get that Trokendi video out. Um, so basically, I'm just on a muscle relaxer now. I took it uh, for the first time last night. It's two milligrams. Um, the name I actually don't have in front of me. Uh, I'll, I'll get you the name in the show notes and let you know next week also. But uh, I woke up at about four o'clock this morning. Um, I didn't take my melatonin last night just because taking a muscle relaxer, um, uh, get my, the experience I have, excuse me, with muscle relaxers uh, made me think that I was just going to sleep without any need for melatonin, but popped wide awake at, uh, I guess it was about 3.30 a.m., four o'clock, and uh, I, I feel super, I'm recording just about an hour and a half after waking up, um, so, you know, if there's any sort of grogginess to my voice or inconsistency in what I'm saying, we'll just blame that this week. Um, but yeah, it's just, uh, I'll, pr I'll probably need to keep the melatonin uh, usage um, the same and incorporate the muscle relaxer. Now, if you're not sure why a, a neurologist would prescribe a muscle relaxer for your migraines, basically it is pain management. Um, certainly it could help you sleep through the night, which you uh, might see uh, reducing overall migraine pain and frequency month to month. Um, but at the very least, it's going to be a uh, basic pain management. A muscle relaxer just kind of confuse my my brain on some of the signals it's receiving and um, just keep my pain levels hopefully down from that uh, five to seven range. Um, and uh, um, hopefully that'll also correspond with the trochendi not being in my system. But uh, uh, some of the migraines that I've been getting even... Um, prior to the last two weeks have just been a little too intense for my liking and so hopefully uh now of course the muscle relaxer is not a long-term solution this like i said is just me being in survival mode for the semester so uh, once the semester is over the muscle relaxer will go away and i will definitely be trying a couple other medications i also want as an uh as an abortive, I definitely want to try a couple different options because the ones that I have right now uh, really don't do much for me um, consistently. And that, that can be very annoying when you're at like a level seven or eight and you just want the pain to stop. So uh, that's kind of where I am at. Sorry for the long winded discussion. Um, things are going okay though. You know, I'm not, not too, um, not really down in the dumps the last couple of podcast intros. I think I sounded probably a little more, uh, you know, beaten down, but that's just the way it is. So um, that being said, that's what's going on with me. If you want to let me know your migraine story, where you're at, just hit me up on social media, search the migraine guy on whatever platform you like. I am everywhere. So that being said, let's get to some migraine news. All right, this week's bit of migraine news comes to us from the website. Where'd it go? There it is, clinicalpainadvisor.com. Clinicalpainadvisor.com um, does a nice job of cataloging and summarizing studies as they relate to pain conditions. And the ones I'm looking at specifically have to do with chronic pain conditions. They do a very nice job of summarizing uh, surveys, studies, and articles as they relate to these conditions. Now, the particular article I'm looking at is entitled Back Pain in Chronic and Episodic Headache. Now, a chronic headache sufferer is someone who's going to be experiencing 15 or more 
more headaches per month. And an episodic headache sufferer is someone who's going to be experiencing less than 15 per month. Anything below that, if you get a headache once every two or three months, technically that is episodic because it's less than 15 per month, but that actually puts you in a more symptomatic or infrequent category. And so this uh, study isn't really going to relate to those people. Basically, if you get some migraines or headaches per month, but it's not more than 15, you are probably episodic. And if it is equal to or more than 15, you are chronic. But the interesting thing that this study um, looks at, and the study is from the European Journal of Pain, and they uh, had about 800 participants in the study. Now, um, one thing to keep in mind is that they gave surveys to the participants to fill out. And so there are, you know, obviously going to be limitations and probably some problems with the study, given that they're relying on the reporting ability of the patients. But they also did have 800. So there does seem to be some potential for interesting um, connections to be made between headache conditions and back pain. So what they found was that of the 800 participants that they had, um, the chronic and episodic headache group reported higher frequencies and higher levels of low back pain than they, uh, they found in the group that did not have chronic or episodic headache. And this is very interesting because it, it, you know, just to be clear, it does not suggest that there is a, a deep, intimate neurological connection between headache and low back pain. What it does seem to suggest, however, and what the study indicates that it suggests is that central sensitization may be a consequence of having chronic or episodic headaches. Now, what is central sensitization? It is a condition of the nervous system that is associated with the development and maintenance of chronic pain. When it occurs, when central sensitization occurs, the nervous system goes through a process called wind up and gets regulated into a constant state of high reactivity. This means that the threshold for what causes pain and subsequently comes to main pain, maintain pain will be there even after the injury might have healed. And so the reason that, uh, at least the theorized reason that headache sufferers, either chronic or episodic, report higher frequency and higher levels of pain with their lower back is because their central nervous system, their peripheral nervous system, their nervous system in general is more sensitive to pain stimulation. The average person who doesn't have a chronic pain condition like chronic headache or episodic headache is not having their central or peripheral nervous system primed for pain reception. We as chronic and episodic migraine sufferers are more primed because we experience pain more frequently. That's why this study is interesting. And so if you do notice that, say, you have more neck pain or more low back pain or more hip pain or more whatever pain than other people you know, even other people in your family, it might be um, the cause of your uh at least awareness of this pain might be because you have a chronic pain condition. Now it's not all sad and um, uh, you know doom and gloom in this area. It's not that we're just going to be suffering more pain and that stinks. Um, although it does stink, there are upshots that um, though the study doesn't indicate or link to um, are well represented in other research as relates to chronic pain conditions. And that is that when you have a chronic pain condition, your ability to deal with the pain, to get through pain and to handle pain is much higher than people who do not have chronic pain conditions or even episodic pain conditions. And so while it certainly does stink that having a episodic or chronic headache condition might make you feel more pain in your body, it also means that the more pain you feel, the more, um, the, sorry, the higher ability that you have to uh, deal with it. And so if you notice that other parts of your body are very, very painful and very, very sensitive, it might not be because anything else is actually wrong with you. It could just be this central sensitization that this study is pointing to. So it's just something to keep in mind, definitely something to talk with your doctor about if you notice that you have any particular pains in joints or uh, muscle areas that are not related to your headache or migraine condition, it might be central sensitization. And that might be able to uh, give your doctor 
a, a different treatment route to help you manage your pain. As I said in the intro, I am currently on a muscle relaxer. Um, I'm not exactly sure if that is going to help um, my low back pain and my neck pain, but I'm definitely going to uh, give it a, a fair shake and see if it helps and see if central sensitization uh, is playing a role as far as I can tell. So that is it for migraine news. We actually have a, uh, a sponsor for the show now, Promius Pharmaceuticals, and they um, want me to give a bit of a summary about what they are interested in as relates to this podcast. So let us get to that now. One thing I've learned is that while you may be able to find a treatment that lowers your migraine attack frequency, you should also be ready for when you experience occasional attacks. As a paid spokesperson for No Time for Migraines, sponsored by Promius Pharma, I wanted to let you know about a great resource to help you better understand your treatment options for when these attacks occur. Visit notimeformigraines.com to get more information about your migraine attacks. This week's migraine tip of the week has to do with when you should and should not be um, pushing your doctor to get an MRI scan. So MRIs are basically the gold standard of imaging, especially for the brain, and uh, specifically fMRIs are, are probably the best. But in general, MRIs are are the kind of imaging uh, scan that is going to show any kind of lesioning in your brain and the dreaded T word, any kind of brain tumor, any growth in there. And so if you're a migraine sufferer, especially a new migraine sufferer, someone who uh, is just starting to either get migraines infrequently or if you're a, a new chronic sufferer, very often and friends and family and your own uh, voices in your head are going to be uh, you know whispering and asking about the dreaded T word a tumor is this a brain tumor and if you go to your doctor and you start talking to them they're very often going to try to put your mind at ease but here is why they're trying to put your mind at ease it's not just that brain tumors are statistically unlikely for you it is because your migraine uh, as a neurological issue if it was caused by um, a tumor or perhaps brain lesioning or something like that, some sort of destructive process in your brain that you would be worried about, there would be a lot more symptoms typically. And that's the kind of thing that they're looking for if they're going to order an MRI. So do you need to worry about um, getting an MRI if your only neurological symptom is migraine? Typically not. In fact, a recent study of 100 migraine sufferers who had MRIs found that 99 out of uh, that 100 had no uh, significant issues with lesions or tumors, only one of the 100 um, had a lesion on their brain. Now, that's not to say that you don't have to be scared about anything related to your migraines and perhaps tumors. Long-term um, suffering from migraines has actually um, shown that sometimes lesioning, very, very similar to uh, the kind of lesioning that occurs with multiple sclerosis, um, can occur in your brain and um, similar to strokes also. And so these are the kind of things that over time you definitely might be concerned about and want to talk to your doctor about getting an MRI. But if your main concern is, well, I have this terrible migraine problem, do I have a brain tumor? There are going to be a series of neurological tests that your doctor or neurologist is going to perform on you that you can actually... Um, you know, watch a couple YouTube videos and read some stuff online and perform this at home. It's not, um, it's not the, the kind of neurological exam that's going to involve any sort of tools. It's not going to involve any sort of special knowledge. Typically, these kind of exams involve touching certain parts of your body to make sure that you have sensations there. And the, the, the parts that they touch correspond to, you know, overall uh, brain um, access to parts of your body. So they want to make sure that you have feeling in your arms, that you have strength in your arms, that you have feeling in your legs, that you have strength in your legs, neck, back, um, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, typically there will be some kind of visual examination. They're definitely going to want to look in your eyes. Um, and they are going to have you walk in front of them. They want to make sure that you have full control, not only of your balance, but of your ability to um, move your body um, uh, in, in a you know healthy fashion when you're walking they want to make sure that there isn't any sort of outstanding issues with your brain's ability to send signals and receive signals and so they're going to do these kind of uh, touchy-feely pokey prodi walk in front of me exams and so long as those um, 
all seem very normal. Um, as, as long as you're able to have sensation and strength and balance, they are not going to think that an MRI is justified typically. Um, now, if you're a chronic sufferer, as I said, the longer that you suffer, the more they might want to just rule it out. Um, uh, not only rule out that you don't have a tumor, but they also are going to want to make sure that you don't have any lesioning. So the lesioning is a long-term concern because migraines do um, kind of create a damaging um uh, they provide damage to your brain over time. And so uh, making sure that you're not experiencing any particular side effects from that is important. But in terms of getting an MRI because you're scared um, that your migraines might be caused by a tumor, um, typically are the kind of things that your doctor is going to try to put you at ease about so long as you pass these simple neurological exams in their office. All right, everyone, in closing, I wanted to uh, remind you that if you have not subscribed, you really should do so. Um, I've got a, a very special guest coming on in the next few weeks to the podcast night. Uh, we'll hopefully be getting the video of that interview on the YouTube channel as well if you want uh, more of a, a video-based interview, uh, if you don't like listening to them on podcast. But the uh, person I'll be interviewing is a state uh, legislator, a state senator in my state of Nebraska, and she is pushing for and I believe she's the only legislator actually pushing for the legalization of medical marijuana, medical grade cannabis. And that is interesting, I think, for two reasons. I think it'll make for good podcasts for two reasons. The first reason is that um, I think just the process of uh, getting a law passed that would take a substance um, and say, we don't care that the federal government says it's illegal, we as a state are going to allow it. So I'm just curious um, on kind of how the whole uh, making something that's illegal, legal process works. But also I'm interested in her motivations. Um, she told me that she also experiences migraines uh, more at the episodic level, not at the chronic level, um, but certainly she is familiar with the pain of a migraine and, um, you know, is right in the same boat as a lot of us. The medications that her doctors give her, the abortives when she does get them, the triptans, the ergots, the uh, uh, NSAIDs, they, they help sometimes, but not consistently, and certainly not as consistently as she has found uh, medical marijuana to be um, a help for her. And so I'm really looking forward to uh, talking with her. Still have some scheduling stuff to figure out and not sure if it's going to be a Skype interview or if it's going to be face to face, because if it's face to face, then I got to buy a couple pieces of hardware. Um, but if it's a Skype interview, then that'll make putting it up on the YouTube channel uh, super easy and making the podcast super easy because I can just extract the audio from that. So make sure to hit subscribe because we've got that coming in the next week or two. Um, thanks for listening. If you haven't subscribed, as I said, I hope you will. If you haven't left a review, I hope you will. And if you want to become a patron, if you like this kind of content and you want to directly support me so that I can continue doing it um, as frequently as possible, you can head over to patreon.com slash the migraine guy. You can uh, subscribe to um, the newsletter that we have and you can donate as little as one dollar per month through patreon patreon's a very secure and very popular platform for uh, people like me who put out online content um, and have an audience or a community that wants to help me continue to do that financially so you can uh, you know give me one dollar a month if you wanted to uh, show your support for the migraine guy until next week or perhaps the week after depending on when I can get the next podcast recorded just remember that you are not alone.